Hello everyone, we're going to get started here. My name is Andrew Willis, and I'm talking on behalf of the Chicago Kent Federal Society. We want to welcome you to this event on 3D printed guns. We have two excellent speakers here today. The first is Professor Josh Blackman. He is a professor of law at South Texas College of Law in Houston, where he specializes in constitutional law, the United States Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. He's the author of multiple books, and he regularly appears on national media outlets. He is the founder and president of the Harlan Institute and is also the founder of Fantasy SCOTUS, the internet's premier pr Supreme Court fantasy league. You should all play. <laughs> Josh clerk for the Honorable Danny J. Boggs on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, as well as the Honorable Kirk Ken R. Gibson on the U.S. District Court of Pennsylvania. He is a graduate of the George Mason School of Law. Professor Mark Rosen joined Chicago Kent in the fall of 1999, where he teaches civil procedure, constitutional law, conflicts of law, and many other courses. He's written numerous law review articles. Prior to joining Chicago Kent, he was, the Bigelow, he was a Bigelow Fellow and a lecturer of law at the University School of Chicago, as well as, a, as an attorney at the law firm Foley, Hogan Elliott in Boston. He has a Harvard, I'm sorry, he has a JD from the Harvard School of Law. We'll begin with Professor Blackman give a presentation, followed by comments from Professor Rosen, and then we'll have a question and answer time. Thank Professor you so Rosen. much. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Professor Rosen, for taking time out of a schedule to come. You are in a treat today. We have not only one constitutional right, but two constitutional rights. We have the First Amendment and the Second Amendment and 3D printed guns. So to start off, who here has ever used a 3D printer? Anyone? A couple people? What'd you make in the back? Ooh, physics? What'd you make? Um, yeah, in front of you. An owl? Was it cute? Yeah, it's cool. And the side, what'd you make with 3D printer? Oh, me? Yeah. I made a phone case. A phone case, okay. So, okay, you guys are fairly benign. None of you made guns. So, so far, I think we're in the right place, okay? Um, 3D printing is a fairly innovative technology. It allows you to do something that most people can't do. I am not artistic. If you gave me a piece of clay, I can't shape it. Right? If you give me a piece of stone, I can't chisel it. If you gave me a piece of wood, I can't saw it. Right? I am not capable of making things. But I can do things with a computer. What 3D printing allows you to do is create in reality what you have in your mind. So the way you begin is with something called CAD, Computer Aided Design. And CAD allows you to design objects on a screen in three dimensions. You can make something as big as a car or even an entire house. And what a 3D printer will do is take your design and translate that information into material, whether it's plastic or even metal. I want to give you a brief tutorial in how to code with 3D printing. It's very simple, and I can teach you in less than a minute. So think back to your high school geometry class. We all remember a cylinder, right? A cylinder. A bottle of water, for example, right? What is a cylinder? A lot of circles, one circle stacked on top of the other. This should be familiar. So if I tell you that I want to make a circle with a height of 20 inches, and a radius, or like a width, of five inches, you would know what to do. If I gave you a piece of clay, you could chisel a cylinder, 20 by five. If I give you a piece of wood, or a piece of stone, in theory, you could chisel it out and make a 20 by five cylinder. Now, how many of you are actually confident that you could actually make it with that level of precision? Probably none of you. But with a 3D printer, you can. You can make all manners of tchotchkes, owls, phone cases, whatever else you want to make, but it works in a very consistent process. This is what a 3D printer looks like. You see here it printed that little race car, which is pretty cool. All right. So how does 3D printing operate? Oh, police going by. Chicago, right? No guns here. Uh, how, does, how does 3D printing work? Has anyone ever made a candle? All right? People have made a candle before? Okay. How do you make a candle? I'll let that pass. 
Okay, yeah, fire truck. Okay. How do you make a candle? Fairly straightforward, right? You take a wick, you dip it in the wax, you pull it out. You dip it in the wax, you pull it out. You dip in the wax, you pull it out, right? Every time you dip the string in the wax, the base gets a little thicker and thicker and thicker. You keep adding a new layer to the candle. 3D printing works in the exact same fashion. But instead of dipping something in wax, a 3D printer sprays a very thin layer of plastic. And this is what it looks like. You have a nozzle that's on a motor. And this motor moves back and forth up and down, and it sprays a little bit of plastic at a time. And each time it sprays plastic, the object gets a little bit taller and taller and taller. And specifically, the bed that's getting sprayed is heated. The reason why it's heated is so that the plastic solidifies very quickly. So the, so the purpose of this is to basically make many small layers of plastic until you have an actual real life object. Okay. So I want to show you next a demonstration of how 3D printing operates. When you see the object that's being created, I want you to raise your hand, okay? It's creating an object that you should know what it is, but it's going to start one layer at a time. All right, so pay attention to this. The first layer comes down, and you see it's sort of honeycomb lattice. This is a very strong base for 3D printing. You don't need to fill the object up. You make sort of these hexagons, these shapes, to start. Okay? So we're going to start, hey, come on in, please. So we're going to start clicking one at a time. When you see it, raise your hand, okay? So here's number one. Number two. Anyone see it yet? Okay. Number three. Come on in. Come on in. Anyone see it yet? All right. Number four. Mm. Anyone see it? Yeah? A frog? Okay, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. He said frog. Number five? Oh, it's like one of those games, right? Okay. See, it keeps adding new layers, one on top of the other. Anyone see it yet? Oh, come on, Chicago Kent. You're going to see it real quick. Anyone see it now? What? A, it's a bust, yeah. Okay. Anyone see it yet? Who? So who is it? Yoda from Star Wars. Good job. Give her the prize, right? Check it out. Oh. Now, now you see it? Right? There it is, right? Now you see it. There it is. There's Yoda. He said frog. I mean, you're in the ballpark. <laughs> Look at that. One, two, and that closes the head off, right? So again, you start with nothing, right? You start with basically a blank piece of plastic. And by putting on different shapes of layering on top of it, you can create a fairly sophisticated design, right? Could any of you make Yoda out of a piece of clay? I don't think so, right? Maybe you can. I don't know. You're artistic. I'm not. But I promise you, all of you could design this on a 3D printer with, fit, with ease and use a computer to make it. Now, fortunately, I'm not here to talk about 3D printing Yoda, right? If people were just 3D printing Yoda, no one would want to have me talking about it. What do people want to 3D print? Guns, right? The reason why this topic has become so controversial is because people have decided to 3D print firearms. The story begins in 2012 when a company known as Defense Distributed, and by the way, I represent them, so I'm their advocate, a company known as Defense Distributed designed the world's first completely 3D printed firearm. It was called the Liberator. This is the barrel of the Liberator, right? What is a barrel of a gun? It's basically a cylinder, just like a bottle of water, and just like the cylinder I had you design a few minutes ago. If I tell you if a cylinder of five inches and a radius of three, you know how big the cylinder is. The same exact code I showed you earlier to make a cylinder, 
can be used to make the barrel of a gun. I tricked you. I played a trick on you. I'm sorry. But that's how easy it is. And this is the cylinder for a liberator. Now, it's a little bit more complicated. There's a little uh, a hole in the middle, and there's a little you know, piece that sticks out here. But the basis of a 3D printed gun is simple geometry, right? So Defense Creative built a lot of parts. Does anyone know what this is? Yeah. Yeah. It's what's called an AR-15 lower receiver. Um, everyone knows what an AR-15 is. Not really. But they don't know how it works. Most of an AR-15 is actually free to buy in any store with no background check. The only part of the AR-15 that actually requires a background check is this, what's called the receiver. It's like a frame that holds all the other pieces together. But the law says you can make your own AR-15 receiver. Even in Chicago, it's true. But you can make your own 3D printed receiver. They also developed magazines, which is basically a box for bullets made out of 3D printers. But what put Defense Distributed on the map was the Liberator. This is the Liberator. What, what the hell is this, right? What are these little squigglies, right? What is this? These are all of the parts needed to make a fully functional single shot pistol. There's the handle, there's the frame, there is a little cylinder, the barrel. These little squiggly, uh, squiggly things, those are the springs. When you pull the trigger back, it creates the action. This is a nail, and that's a bullet. Those are not made of plastic. Um, bullets generally are not made out of plastic. They may have metal. You can have plastic bullets, they're not very effective. Um, why do you need a nail? All right. A gun operates in a very simple fashion. At the back of a bullet is a little bit of gunpowder. If you pierce the back of a bullet, it creates an explosion. Boom. Which sends the projectile forward. Right? This little thing over here, this little, it's a little bit more yellow than the other part. That's what actually flies out. When you push your gun, the shell casing stays still, the bullet flies out with the projectile. All you need to make a gun is something sharp to pierce the back of a bullet. Okay? This is what the Liberator, looks like, uh, the Liberator looks like when it's fully assembled. And if you notice, there's a rope on the floor. The reason why the rope is there was because the gun wasn't very safe at first, right? And if you're testing a gun and you want to pull the trigger, you want to make sure you keep all 10 of your fingers. So initially, they would put a string on the trigger and send very far away and pull the trigger. Now, there's an aspect of gunsmithing you never thought of. Why are guns made out of steel? Steel has a unique property. When it heats up, it expands. When it cools down, it contracts, which is exactly what you need for a gun. When you pull the trigger, it gets really hot, things go flying, and then when it gets cooler, it comes back down. Plastic does not have that property. Plastic is very brittle. If you ever accidentally put a plastic wrapper in a microwave, we've all done that, right? Yes, we've all, I've done it. I did this week, in fact. If you leave that little plastic film on your food and you put it in the microwave, it melts. Right? Plastic cannot handle high heat in the same fashion that steel can. So it's not a very good idea to make a plastic gun. It doesn't really do anything. It's not very effective. It's not good aim. But the Liberator caused an international scandal. It made news around the world. So let's start with a simple question. Is there any problem with 3D printing a gun? Is it illegal? Right? Well, people think of 3D printed guns, this is what they think of, right? You click print and like a fully functional gun pops out. No, this is not how it works. This may surprise you, but it is perfectly legal to make your own firearm. Yes, even in Illinois, it's true. So who here knows what a zip gun is? Yeah, what's a zip gun? Yeah. It is very easy to make a gun by yourself. Very easy. This gun, it's a, gardering, it's a garden hose and a soldering iron. You take the base of a garden hose and you drill it onto a soldering iron. And you've made a gun. I found another picture online somewhere. This is a keychain flashlight, which you can use to manufacture a firearm. No printing necessary. Okay, I'm going to show you a demonstration of how easy it is 
to make a homemade gun. But please do not try this at home. Please listen to me. Don't try this at home. These guys are morons. You'll see why in a minute, right? <laughs> just please, just, if you try this at home, don't blame me. OK, it's on you. So with their, with their snazzy flip phone camera, right? No, this is legit. Um, these guys made a gun out of a piece of rubber tubing, a metal pipe, and a shotgun shell. That's it. I can take you to Home Depot, and for $10, I can buy all the parts I need to make a gun. A gun a hell of a lot more effective than a plastic gun, I should add. So he has this work. On the back of this metal pipe is a little dimple, right? A little thing that sticks out, this little thing right here. OK. So what they're going to do, they're going to load the shotgun shell into this rubber tube, OK? And he's going to jam the back of the pipe into the rubber tube. OK, so what's wrong with this picture, right? Hey, come on in, it's fine. What's wrong with this picture? Anyone see? There's something really horribly wrong with this picture. Thermodynamics. OK, thermodynamics, professor, answer. It's a much simpler answer, right? Was that? Yeah, his finger is in front of the bullet. That's also a bad thing, right? It's a much easier answer. What's wrong with this? I, this entire everything. What's wrong with everything here? Okay, let's see it. And what's this little yellow thing coming here? Here, I'll show you another picture. It's a little clearer. There's an electrical outlet coming down, and there's a fan that's plugged in. So again, don't try this at home. They are firing a bullet into a box about two feet away behind an electrical outlet. You can't aim this. Thermodynamics, Professor <laughs> Rosen said it quite well. This is going pew, right? And you can tell there are multiple holes on this box. They've done this before. <laughs> yeah, it must be safe. They didn't blow up the house before, OK? So what's going to happen, right? They go three, two, one, and they're going to jam it in. Ready? Ready? Three, two, one, boom. They just made a lethal weapon, right? They just made a firearm with the parts you can buy at Home Depot for about 10 bucks. Um, lethal, fatal, legal. Now, it may not be legal to fire it inside. I don't know what the local ordinances are on that. Many places have laws printing from firing a gun inside. But they didn't break any law. And look how proud they are, right? You see the smoke is coming out of the shell, right? They made a gun. And there's the spent shell. The federal government has absolutely no problem with what they just did. If they try to sell that gun, they need to obtain a license, what's called a federal firearm license to sell it. But they merely make it for their own idiotic consumption, it's not a problem. So then why are 3D printed guns so controversial? If you can print them yourself and make your own guns, then who cares? Why am I giving this presentation? So you get free food, I suppose, right? But why am I giving this presentation? The problem wasn't when Defense Distributed made the Liberator. The problem was when Defense Distributed posted the information on the internet of how to make it, right? This isn't primarily a Second Amendment case, although the Second Amendment plays a factor. I'll get there in a minute. This is primarily a First Amendment case, specifically the government telling people, you can't put information on the internet, right? What the State Department said to Defense Distributed is you can't share on the internet information for how to manufacture a 3D printed firearm. So let's start with some basic First Amendment stuff, right? The, the basic tenet of our Constitution and free speech is the government can't restrict what you're saying on the basis of its content, right? A content base restriction is generally subject to what's known as strict scrutiny. This should sound familiar from your first year con law class. Why? When the government classifies content on the basis of its content, they're picking a side. We'll allow this type of content to go forward, but not that content. And that's considered very problematic. So the courts are suspicious. But you might say, wait a minute, Josh. They're not 
they're not imposing classifications because of its content. They're imposing classifications because it's dangerous. You can use this information to build a gun, and guns are bad. Well, how many of you heard of the anarchist cookbook? Yeah, a couple hands just went up. Yeah, There's always a couple. Uh, this is a manual of how to be a terrorist. I'm only slightly exaggerating. Uh, yeah, slightly, right? Um, it tells you how to make bombs, how to make explosives, how to make poison, how to kidnap people, how to hold hostages, right? This is like, we're in Chicago, this is weather underground stuff, right? This is like, this is original OG stuff, right? Um, bookstores in the 60s and 70s tried to ban this book from the shelves. Before there was Amazon and Kindle, you had actually bookstores. You had libraries. And the court tell that, you, that the government can't censor these books, even though they can be used to do bad stuff. And I think that's still the principle today. The mere fact that you can take this information and use it for ill doesn't give the government the license to censor it. In fact, most people who download these files don't actually make the gun. They download it for artistic purposes. They download it to explore shapes and how to modify the gun and make it work in different fashions. There's artistic, literary, and social value to these files far beyond actually manufacturing the firearm. You say, wait a minute, Josh, we're talking about books here. These are files and code. Well, the court has held that the mere fact that you express yourself in a computer doesn't deprive you of your first amendment protections. Data is speech. Information is speech. In a case called Sorrell v. IMS Health, recently retired Justice Anthony Kennedy uh, stated the issue pretty cleanly. He said that the creation and dissemination of information are speech. And this is a fairly basic principle. Whether you write a violent novel or make a violent video game, I think the courts have applied the First Amendment in the uh, uh, same fashion. Okay? We live in a world where everything has code. But this is not only a First Amendment case, I think it's also implicated by the Second Amendment. Right? The Second Amendment provides a right to keep and bear arms. In a case called DCV Heller, the Supreme Court held that this is a right that's individual in nature. It does not require service in the militia. It's an individual right to keep and bear arms. And a couple years later, in a case called McDonald v. City of Chicago, yes, you, uh, the Supreme Court held that Chicago's handgun ban was unconstitutional. Why does this matter? Heller and McDonald only concern the right to keep a handgun at home. And the Supreme Court hasn't revisited this doctrine in years. Indeed, perhaps now with the new member of the court, Justice Kavanaugh, uh, the court may see, see fit to take another Second Amendment case, but we'll see. So, so far, the Supreme Court has only said that there's a right to keep a gun in the house. But I think there's also a couple of the rights at issue, one of which is a right to acquire arms. And what do I mean by that? Imagine the government passes a law and they say, um, you can have a gun if you already have it, but you can't buy any new guns. I think such a law would actually violate the Second Amendment because people who have the guns are privileged and people who don't have it aren't able to get them yet. Now, I'm not saying that this is a right that's absolute, the government can't restrict sales, but I think it's a general tenor that the first, I'm sorry, the Second Amendment protects a right to acquire new arms. And this is Dick Heller getting his gun permit. Now, maybe you agree with me on that one, maybe you don't. But my second argument is a lot stronger. There's a right to make arms. Since the beginning of our republic, long before we had stores, gun stores, if you wanted a gun, you made it yourself. Right, the militiamen, right? They couldn't go to Walmart, right, or Cabela's and buy a rifle. They had to manufacture it themselves. So I think there's a fairly deeply rooted tradition in our country of people making their own arms. And that's why to this day, to today, there's no prohibition on making your own firearm. There are restrictions you can have a machine gun, or you can't sell off a, shot, a, 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 a shotgun barrel, but as a general matter, you can make your own firearm to fit your own needs. So I think there's both a right to acquire arms and also a right to make arms under the auspices of the Second Amendment. But there's more, right? If you think about it, what the government's doing here is you're saying that you can't share information about how to make a gun, right? That implicates two rights. I'll give you an example, right? If the government passes a law saying you can't wish someone a Merry Christmas, you know, an actual war on Christmas, right? The government says you can't wish someone a Merry Christmas. Is that, a, is that a violation of free speech? 
or free exercise. Can't say Merry Christmas, maybe both, right? This is what the law calls a hybrid right, where a single law implicates two amendments. And the court said that these rights reinforce each other. So when you tell someone you can't speak about how to make a gun, I think it's a hybrid right, which implicates the first and the second amendments. All right. So I've given you the Constitution. Let's talk about the statute, right? Are there laws in the books that restrict 3D printed guns? Yes. There is something called the Undetectable Firearms Act. It was enacted in 1988. Limit 1988. A lot of you weren't even born that year, were you? No. Aren't, I know, right? Aren't plastic guns like new? How could Congress ban a law banning undetectable guns 30 years ago? Plastic guns are not new. This technology is not new at all. So for the last three decades, it's been illegal to possess a firearm that will not trigger a metal detector. And that's still the law. I don't have a problem with that law. But again, why did Congress pass this law? It had to do with a Glock handgun. Do you know what a Glock handgun is? Right? It's always in the rap songs, right? The Glock is a, a good rhyme, right? Uh, but, but the Glock is a very popular handgun. And unfortunately, this is Bruce Willis' fault. Um, it's Bruce Willis' fault, I'm sorry. In the Die Hard movie, Bruce Willis had this one line, which I will read and I will butcher it. But he goes, luggage, that punk pulled the Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. It doesn't show up on your airport extra machines here, and it costs more than what you make in a month. Every aspect of that sentence is incorrect, okay? There is no Glock 7, that model doesn't exist. It's not made of porcelain, it's made out of metal. It's not made in Germany, it's made in Austria. It will show up in an extra machine, and they're fairly affordable. But how does Congress legislate? In reaction to action movies, right? They see a movie like, oh my god, we gotta ban this. So in response to a Bruce Willis movie, Congress bans things that doesn't really exist. So we have this Undetectable Firearms Act. You can't have a plastic gun. If you do, you're a felon. Indeed, the Liberator has a design where you basically solder a piece of metal into the handle, and that complies with the law. So if you actually make the gun without that, you are now a felon. Okay? So what's new, right? There were efforts after the defense distributed weapon to ban 3D printed guns altogether. That did not go anywhere. There have been efforts saying, well, maybe we should ban plastic, right? So people can't 3D print guns. Um, that's pretty foolish. Why? You can 3D print in plastic or you can 3D print metal, like Terminator 2 style, right? You can actually make a 3D printed gun out of metal. That, that defeats the purpose, right? If it's metal, it's detectable. You can buy a much cheaper metal gun elsewhere. But you can 3D print anything. Okay? Now, how did the government actually come down and catch defense distributed export control law? Now, this is an area that law students are generally not exposed to. But there are certain technologies that are so sophisticated, the government won't let you share them with non-US persons. All right? So, for example, if I have uh, a missile launcher, and I want to ship it to, I don't know, like Afghanistan, right? The government might not be happy about me doing that. So there are restrictions on the trafficking of arms. But the government's rules about arms aren't limited to actual things that explode. They also apply to what's called technical data. Technical data. So for example, if I have the blueprints of a nuclear submarine, very classified, right, how a nuclear submarine operates, I think the government might have a fairly good argument that that should not be sent to China. I think everyone might agree with that, right? You know, probably a good idea. But what if we're not dealing with classified blueprints? What if we're dealing with open source code? Code that was put into the public domain, right? The Liberator was not designed to be classified, it was meant to be shared. Can the government restrict access to openly available information that's in the public domain? and prevent you from posting it on the internet. So over the last 30 years, there's been a struggle within the government, right? The Department of Justice has always said, you can't do that. That would violate the First Amendment. So for example, after the Oklahoma City bombing, Congress said, can we ban posting on the internet instructions to make fertilizer bombs? Right, Oklahoma City involved a fertilizer bomb. DO just said, no, you can't do that, right? That's a content-based restriction. They were right. But the State Department always said, well, maybe we could do this. 
And in the 1990s, you had a situation with a cryptography book, right? Someone wants to actually send a book with a CD-ROM in it. Remember those CDs, the little things that spin around, right? With code on it. And the State Department said, you can mail the book, but you, you can't include the CD-ROM overseas without getting a government license. This case bounced back and forward. But it didn't come to the fore until Defense Distributed, which again was my client. In 2013, the State Department sent a letter to Defense Distributed and said, you must remove from the internet immediately the following files, right? This was not a takedown notice from the owner of a copyright or a patent. This was a takedown notice from the government. And the government never before ordered someone to take a file off the internet. It hasn't happened. Uh, we've been litigating this case for the last five years. Um, it's still in the courts. You've probably read about it. Uh, well, maybe I'll answer some questions about it during the Q&A. Uh, but I think for the reasons that we've argued in court, uh, we have First Amendment issues here. The government can't censor speech on the basis of its content. And moreover, I think we do have Second Amendment issues here. But I'll stop right here. I'll turn it over to my good friend, Professor Rosen, and I welcome your questions later. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor Blackman. And uh, thanks to all of you for coming here. So um, there's a lot that we agree on. And um, I'll identify that and then the points where I think we disagree. So uh, I might well be willing to agree that there's um, constitutional rights that are at issue here. Um, um, fine. Um, I will agree that there's First and Second Amendment rights that might be presented by um, some of the questions that you, ri uh, you raise. Fine. You and I both agree, now we get into the real important fine points, you and I both agree that um, uh, constitutional rights, even when they're at issue, are not absolute, right? The strict scrutiny test that you recited um, allows for regulation of speech, allows for the government to interfere with my religious practices and so forth. Um, so long as there's, well, at least with regard to speech, a compelling governmental interest most of the time, sometimes even less than that. But there, there has to be a substantially important governmental interest to justify a uh, governmental restriction. We agree with that, right? And that's true even if you have what you call a hybrid right. In other words, even if a given activity is covered by both the First and Second Amendment, that doesn't mean that that activity is completely immune from governmental regulation. Right? At the most, you'd get strict scrutiny. Um, fine. So then the question becomes, it seems to me, um, uh, whether uh, there is a compelling governmental interest, or perhaps even less, uh, under intermediate scrutiny. Uh, because as you well know, with regard to the Second Amendment at least, we don't have um, uh, a fixed and determinate level of scrutiny that um, regulations are subject to. So let me just uh, call it whether there's a sufficiently important governmental interest. The question is whether there, um, whether this technology, which um, permits anybody um, uh, to immediately print out a um, uh, effective and safe weapon, something that's quite different from the homemade weapons that you yourself were describing um, are available to me if I uh, foolishly go into Home Depot. Um, but whether the availability of technology that allows absolutely anybody now or perhaps sometime in the present to um, print out a gun, thereby, for example, uh, circumventing all uh, registration requirements that um, you yourself actually, I think, have said uh, generally you have no constitutional problem with. The question is whether this kind of technology um, presents a safety concern such that um, regulating it um, would account, would qualify as a compelling governmental interest. That seems to me to be the, the crucial question that we might both agree upon. That's the, that's the question. And um, OK, so uh, then we have to get in, kind of get into the empirics of um, what kind of threat is posed by this kind of technology, A. And B, even if it's not a present threat because plastics 
are plastic, you know, 3D printers are expensive, um, whether the government can take uh, action now in advance of the, quote, genie getting out of the bottle, because that's something else that you also recognize. You recognize that once the technology is out there and available, um, it's there forever. Um, so, uh, you know, those are, those are the questions. Um, you know, how it's to be determined whether there is a sufficiently important governmental reason um, to, uh, uh, to regulate um, this kind of material. And, um, and then once you answer that, that determines the means analysis. Because means analysis, the second prong in strict scrutiny or in, uh, intermediate scrutiny, is parasitic on the ends analysis. Right? You, you determine whether it's appropriate means in relation to whatever the ends are. So the truth is that I really enjoyed your presentation and I learned a lot from it, but I didn't see much, you know, we haven't had the discussion yet about um, uh, whether there might be a compelling governmental interest or sufficient governmental interest um, to regulate um, this information. And, um, uh, you know, and the truth is I'm not in a position to, uh, to have that technical uh, discussion, um, but, uh, but that's, the, that's the important question. Then uh, an ancillary question is, you know, what institutions properly play the role in answering that question? Is it a question that's answered properly um, just by courts? Is it a question that, um, you know, um, an informed legislature, um, you know, their estimation of what counts as a sufficiently important interest, uh, you know, ought to be uh, given, you know, some uh, substantial deference. That's, you know, th those are ancillary questions. Now, one other thing I'll just say, just to make everybody realize, even when it comes to, like, core speech, like political speech, um, there are absolute bans out there that have been upheld by the United States Supreme Court, like in Burson v. Freeman, where on, a, you know, days of uh, uh, election, on election day, um, there's laws that ban, absolutely ban, all political messaging um, within certain number of feet of uh, polling stations. That's, that's core political speech. And, um, you know, the court upheld that, actually, because it held that there was, uh, you know, sufficiently important reason trying to maintain the uh, integrity and the well-runningness of, uh, of elections to allow for that. You know, so I'm just trying to give you a sense that, uh, you know, speech, um, along with every other dear constitutional right of ours, um, can be regulated. There's, you know, um, extortion is illegal even though it's speech. Um, there's, there's, there's lots of things that can be prohibited. Um, the ultimate question is, uh, is there a sufficiently important governmental interest to allow regulation here? Okay, that's my primary point. Here's a secondary point. Um, I said I might be willing to agree that there's constitutional rights at issue, um, so let me clarify why I'm not 100% sure. Um, in a circumstance where um, firearms can be obtained commercially, it's not at all clear to me that there would be even a constitutional right that would extend to manufacturing one's own firearm. And um, even if it's true, I mean, look at the language of the Constitution. We have the right to, you know, bear arms, even if bear arms means that you have to have access to arms, which I probably would agree with that. Does having access to arms in a circumstance where there's commercial availability and the government can't ban the sale of arms, does that extend to uh, encompass a right, a constitutional right of individual citizens to manufacture their own arms? And it seems to me that the mere fact that we haven't had bans of that in the past is not a sufficient basis to say that that is a constitutional right uh, nowadays, although it would depend on your constitutional methodology, perhaps. Um, but, um, you know, so uh, I'd want to talk more about that um, as well. But again, even if the constitutional right were to extend to creating one's own weapon, um, we still would be left with the very first question that I identified, which is, is there a sufficiently strong governmental interest to justify um, regulation of this new technology? And of course, it, this is a, it seems to me, um, a, well, you seem to agree as well, a fundamentally new technology. I mean, I don't have to be expert anymore to create a firearm. Um, I don't have to subject myself to the risk of, um, you know, of 
of having the rear part of the firearm uh, fly into my abdomen because I didn't realize that every action creates an equal and opposite reaction. Right? The whole point of these CAD files is that there's some expert out there who um, has presumably you know, done all the, um, uh, the testing of this and all I have to do is press a button because as, as you say in the first 10, 15 minutes, you know, anybody um, can create this uh, once they have access to the computer and to the printer. You know, so uh, that's a, a new circumstance um, that um, we could have, um, I think, an illuminating discussion um, concerning you know, whether that's a sufficiently new circumstance such that the government's failure to um, regulate the manufacture, the home manufacture of uh, guns in the past, um, you know, doesn't shed much light on the constitutionality of, um, of their ability to do that uh, in the future in light of this technology. All right, that's my, uh, that's my comments. I would love to have a conversation. Yeah. Thank you. So I think we do agree on quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> I think where we jump off, though, is respect to how novel this is. Um, the bottom line is we have information that can be used to make something dangerous. Uh, the, the degree of difficulty, I think, does vary. Um, it's actually quite difficult to actually make a liberator, and let me explain why. Plastic is not designed to explode. Um, to actually make an effective liberator, it's not as simple as point-click shoot. You actually have to treat the barrel in a vinegar and acetone bath and heat it in such a way to treat it so it handles the combustion. So there's actually a lot of work that goes into it. Also, if I simply gave you the files, it wouldn't come out the way you think you do. There's actually a lot of work involved in what's called layering and slicing, which I don't want to bother getting into. There's still some intervention of the human mind before it comes out. But we do have some cases on point, right? We have a case called the Progressive, very famous case, involving the hydrogen bomb, right, where this magazine wanted to print the instructions of how to make an H-bomb. And a federal district court, was it in Illinois? I think it was. I think it was a federal district court in Illinois actually entered an injunction barring this magazine from publishing this bomb. That decision did not age well. And people generally agree that that was a wrong decision. And if you follow the instructions step by step in that manual, you get a bomb of far greater proportions. So I think that's one precedent. Um, a second precedent I think is worth talking about is the Pentagon Papers case. Very famous case aside from the 1970s, uh, where the New York Times and the Washington Post tried publishing the Pentagon Papers. And these were highly classified documents that discussed troop movements in Southeast Asia. And a district court actually entered an injunction to stop the Times from publishing this information. They already published some of it, but they didn't publish all of it. And the Supreme Court said unanimously that you can't stop people from speaking. If you want to punish them after the fact for having this information, perhaps you can do it, because it was classified. You can't stop them from speaking in the first place. So let me bring this back to the case we're talking about here. I don't have a problem, excuse me, I don't have a problem with the government banning possession of plastic firearms that are undetectable. I actually don't have a problem with that. I don't even know if I'd have a problem with a ban on printing them. I think that's actually a closer call. Right? I think the, the right to manufacture, again, is not well settled. So I, I, I'd be willing to have a debate on whether the government could ban the printing of it. But the threshold question, and the only question I'm talking about here, is the right to share information about how to make them. Not the manufacturing, but the sharing it. Now, perhaps the government can say is once you have the information, it's too late. The cat's in the bag, the genie's out of the bottle. I don't think the government can take that extra step. They can perhaps ban the possession Maybe they can ban the manufacture, but they can't ban the sharing of files that by themselves are harmless. And I will give you a very easy line drawing issue. How the hell do you enforce this? Right? How do you describe in a statute a file? That's a gun. Looks just like a barrel to me. This is something that's very difficult for the government to do in terms of administrability. And I think you will have a lot of overbreath problems where a lot of files that are not used to make guns will be swept in. And you'll have this wide censorship of speech in a realm the government really can't enforce. So I think you have some over-breath problems, I think you have under-inclusiveness problems, 
and I think you have a lot of strict scrutiny failures. So I don't see how the actual ban on the sharing of the information would work. Now, fortunately, no such statute exists. I'll make this point very clear. The State Department regulations do not talk about this issue in the least. What I'm talking about is could, could the state draft a statute that says we ban putting on the internet files that can be used to 3D print a gun. No such law exists in the country. Uh, New Jersey is considering such a law, and I don't think it'll survive scrutiny, but so that's why no such law exists. Is there anything you want to add or go to Q&A? No, just two quick points. Please. Is, um, in terms of the first, uh, even though presently with regard to the liberator, there might be some human intervention that's required in an agency, um, certainly uh, as technology develops, um, that may well uh, diminish and might become more automatic. And the question would be, for instance, whether government um, in regulating can um, sort of take account of uh, foreseeable technological uh, innovations um, in their regulations. Um, that's point number one. Point number two, I mean, I agree with you that you, you're, um, um, the hardest question is um, whether the government can ban the sharing of information. I agree with that. And I do agree that it would be really difficult um, to, uh, you know, to enact something that we're not um, overbroad. Um, it's, uh, I don't know if that makes it impossible. Um, I don't know if, um, uh, for me at least, actually, um, that concern, you know, it might mean that empirically I can't do it or the government can't. Um, I understood our discussion to be more about sort of like conceptually whether it's appropriate for government to, and I have to say I have, um, uh, I guess I, I fall out differently on um, like the hydrogen bomb, for example, and um, I think that you know publication of, uh, of information that could lead to the um, the, you know, the creation of, a, of an atomic weapon, and um, it's uh, you know I, I think that it's a, it's an interesting and important debate um, to have about um, what ought to be the, um, uh, the government's prerogative to. Uh, to ban this kind of information. Um, I do agree that's the, that's the hardest uh, question, but even with regard to that, I, um, I don't presume um, that the answer is it's absolutely unregulatable as a matter of principle. Okay, thanks, Professor Rosen. All right, we have time for some questions from students. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you for the Thank you. Oh, please. When the gun was fired, the fire team does not penetrate the crime. If it penetrates, then the shooter will get injured because the whole NP got it back. So it merely knocks on crime, crime ignites the power, so it does not penetrate. Thank penetrate. you for the correction. Appreciate so it. That's fine. So that's not penetrate. Another thing is, um, Professor Rosen talked about regulations. Um, actually, current regulations regarding the manufacture of guns apply to uh, 3D printing on as well. Uh, you can only, for your own use, if you want to sell it, you have to register it. Yeah. Uh, has to be 50% made of metal and not be fully plastic. Uh, so those regulations are already there. It regulates regular who make guns, it regulates also student guns. Another thing I have a feeling that this whole thing is being exaggerated because as a dealer myself, I have absolutely no interest in that sort of gun because it's useless. Garbage. Yeah. I actually, it's a lot cheaper to buy tools and parts to make a real safe semi automatic uh, semi modern AR-15 at home in the basement. Cost about $300 parts and uh, So I will never buy a 3D printing machine for the purpose of printing a one-shot plastic gun. So. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're right. It, it, it's paranoia, right? It sounds really scary, but if you want to have an undetectable firearm, you're not going to use a 3D printer. There are far easier ways of making these. Uh, and they're not very effective. The plastic is brittle. It'll break. It's not safe. You can buy it. We're you can go down the street and buy a gun from a guy in the street for a lot less than it costs to make this gun. It'll be far more effective. Yeah. Oh, it's another hand. Yeah, Andrew. Uh, what were some of the compelling interests the government um, put forth in your case? Um, so the case here actually isn't about domestic safety. It's about international affairs. They, they, they brought, they brought a, a, uh, uh, an enforcement claim ag against this uh, international law. And they said it could, you know, Al-Qaeda can get these, right? 
They're afraid that terrorists abroad might use these in foreign assassinations. And these claims are fanciful, but you know, they said, they actually said in their brief, I'm paraphrasing, that a foreign leader might be assassinated with a 3D printed gun. Okay. I mean, pretty remote, but okay. Other questions? Yeah. Isn't it with printing of a low receiver, though? Because uh, my understanding is when you print a low receiver, you're printing a non functioning receiver at 80%. And that's the meaning of the non functioning receiver. Once yeah. you actually start to carve it out, the holes, yeah. Yeah. And then it actually is a legal hole. You cannot print that. Here in most places, that's right. Uh, I don't know the laws in Illinois. What, what's the what's the about making our lowers? Well, Yeah. yeah. But do you have to register after you drill the holes or no? Uh, if, as long as you go south. Yeah. So, so again, even in Illinois, it's, thank you for confirming this, what I thought. Even in Illinois, if you manufacture your own AR-15 by drilling the holes in this, what's called the 80% uh, lower, as long as you don't sell it, you're fine. It's yours. And you don't have to tell the government about it. So all of this, again, is a lot of paranoia. If you want to make a homemade gun that's a lot more effective, you don't need a 3D printer. Um, there are far more effective ways of doing it. That are not illegal. Uh, yeah. So the way that those are manufactured, just a regular, like, I mean, you can wear metal. It's metal that doesn't detect your standard metal detectors. That could hit a pin. Like, I mean, when I wear my belt through the Daily Center, for instance, it doesn't go on. Or like pins, or things like that. I'm just curious, is it actually able to be manufactured in such a way that you walk through? Regular metal detector. Are you talking about uh, the Liberator? Or what, what gun are you yeah, talking about? Well, the Liberator, again, it's designed to have a block of metal in it that would trigger it. Um, if you have a gun without it, that's, that, that, that's, that's illegal. Well, you can't I mean, have that. Like, can you make it, if I just remove that block of metal, would it still fire? It would. It would. As, so that's all it would take, take back into the. And let me, let me make this point. In 1988, there were undetectable firearms. Yeah. yeah. No, so I'm there's, there's nothing. There's not, yeah, so this, this is a general response to gun control questions. If you're intent on smuggling a gun into a sensitive place, you're going to smuggle a gun into a sensitive place. And 3D printers are not a particularly smart way of doing so. Um, you can make a gun out of plastic, out of rubber, out of wood. There are lots of ways. Now, bullets may have metal. Um, the bullet will probably trigger more than the, the, the plastic itself. So I guess you have a gun without a bullet. I don't know what that will do, but you can have that. What else? Anyone else? Thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, it's fun. Enjoyable. Thank you.